Hello everyone, um, welcome to my presentation on rectifying your application. Now I do see a couple of familiar faces in the room, but for those who don't know me, let me start off by introducing myself. My name is Christoph van Sever, I work as an IT consultant for a company called Faros, and I'm also a Spring Certified Instructor. I mostly teach the Spring Core and Spring Enterprise courses, among other ones. Now, Faros is an ID consultancy company from Leuven, uh, a city close to Brussels here in Belgium. We're mostly focused on Java technology and the Spring ecosystem um, in quite a bit of different sectors like the automotive industry, food industry, uh, banks, insurances, etc. And at Faros, we think that keeping up to date with latest trends and technologies really is essential to better ourselves and to be able to help clients with better solutions. Now, we do this through uh, trainings, internal trainings, external trainings, uh, also internal workshops, also workshops, for example, for university colleges, etc. And from that also grew our Reactive Competence Center, where we look, well, we um, experiment with reactive technologies, uh, we build proof of concepts, etc. Now, what can you expect from this quickie? Well, I'm going to highlight, to try and highlight at least, the most important bits to know about uh, reactive programming, reactive systems, um, and also trying to fill in some missing pieces that some other talks seem to skip or seem to you know, not get deep into enough. Now, um, this mostly comes from practical experience, um, from the proof of concepts, from actually you know, using the code. I'm not here to sell something, but I'm here to try and explain how it can help for a regular programmer. If you have any questions, or you think I'm a cool guy and want to have a beer after, you can just ask me after. Now, before I start talking about uh, reactive programming or reactive systems, I want to talk about something called cargo cults. Now, a cargo cult is actually a concept from uh, a bit after the Second World War. It was coined by a sociologist back then. And it described a phenomenon seen around the Pacific area. Um, basically, the Japanese and American armies were fighting there. Uh, and during the war, um, they would make runways for their airplanes to land. Um, and the native people there, the indigenous people around the Pacific, would see the uh, soldiers building them, would see them you know, signaling for the airplanes to land. And they would see, actually, airplanes landing. So they started assuming that if they also built runways like that and also started signaling, then the airplanes, which would bring cargo, like food, medic med medication, um, weapons, etc., would magically appear. Now, that's also something we tend to see in the IT. Um, we go to conferences and, you know, um, see interesting technologies, but we don't always apply them in the, in the right sense because we're not, use, well, we're mixing up um, the reason why and the action itself. Now, the same goes with all the technologies. We're used to doing things in a certain way, but that might not be the ideal way, <coughs> ideal way at least, yeah. Um, an example of, you know, uh, being able to think outside of the box is actually the reactive manifesto, reactive systems. Um, the reactive manifesto actually doesn't contain new ideas. Uh, those are ideas that come from Smalltalk, a uh, programming language from way, way uh, in the past. And it describes building applications that are distributed and consist out of uh, you know, different parts that communicate with each other in an event-driven way. The goal, for, well, the goal is actually to create a responsive application, an application that um, <clears throat> is resilient and elastic, is able to continuously deliver business value to users, and it does this by being message-driven. And whole, this whole concept is um, being called um, being responsive. Now, um, an example of a framework in order to do this is Vertex. It's a toolkit to build reactive applications on the JVM. That's how it sells itself. And you can actually use it to build event-driven microservices that can communicate with each other through, for example, an event bus using uh, Hazelcast or through other ways. Um, it's actually a very interesting framework to take a look at. Another one is Aka Actors. Um, Aka Actors is a huge topic that on itself deserves different um, 
different um, talks on itself, so it's a bit limited, this talk, the quickie. Um, but it's very comparable to how a small talk works. Um, it uses actors that communicate with each other through messaging and also enables you to build a huge message-driven system. It also offers supervision and monitoring through um, an external runtime. So yeah, it really helps you build a system that's self-healing and scales really well. Now from reactive, pro uh, reactive systems at least, through reactive programming, where we uh, try to also um, supply a better programming model to help build reactive systems, we're going to try and use resources in a more performant way. We do this by creating um, asynchronous boundaries in our application. So um, instead of you know, just calling the database, waiting for the result, and then giving the result to the user, we're going to uh, ask the database for information and then subscribe ourselves to the result and work in a declarative way. Now, an example of this can be seen in Project Reactor. Um, Project Reactor is, is used in Spring 5 to enable reactive programming. And for example, here we see uh, that we have a pick repository where we're going to get a list of picks, really simple. And we can see that it's actually being run in a declarative way. Um, and you can really imagine the pick uh, objects running through the different parts one by one in an asynchronous way. So the program doesn't block. Now, um, the first big tip is to not overreact. Um, like I said in the cargo girl bit, it's very exciting, fun new technology, but it certainly has its limitations right now. But if you believe that your project is suitable for it, then go ahead and be sure to use it and maybe give us a call. Um, but when it comes to over, well, when it comes to reactive programming, at least, it's important that you have to make sure that your whole team is ready because you're really making a complete paradigm shift. You're programming in a different way, you're architecturing in a different way. But you also have to make sure that your application server uh, and your database server is ready for it. Um, there are a couple of experimental, um, for example, MySQL drivers, I believe, to support reactive programming, but most of the support right now is seen in OSQL databases like Cassandra, like MongoDB, etc. Now, when it comes to reactive programming, it's also important to uh, really change your mindset. When you make a program, you're used to, you know, you you have your um, application server, which calls the database server. It waits for information, and then it gets a whole set in one go. This doesn't really count anymore, because when you really want to enjoy the full benefits of having a reactive application, you're basically waiting for the events that come back from the database, consisting out of the information that you would normally retrieve in one go. So you get them one by one. And you really have to change your mindset. Basically, you go from a robot that does one thing after another to a whole factory that produces output for your user. And the big advantage of that is, of course, that your user gets information right away. It doesn't, it, the user doesn't have to wait for the whole data set to return. From the first element uh, that's returned just goes through your application server and goes all the way to the user. So that's a big advantage. Now, in order to be able to do that, of course, you have to remove dependencies um, to aggregations. The aggregations you would normally need the whole data set for, well, you basically have to make the user do them, or for example, the client application. For example, if you need a sum of elements, you do need the entire set, so um, that's something you have to consider. Also, like I said before, you really have to make it clear for the entire team. Um, your analysis need to make, um, well, they need to make your UIs, for example, if they design your UIs, UIs they uh, have to be ready for it. They have to be able to handle real-time application streaming in. Your architects need to make reactive systems, need to design them. Um, your developers also need to be schooled in you know, reactive code, being able to program in a reactive way. And your system engineers or DevOps team also needs to be able to run the code. They need to have the knowledge to have the right application servers or the right uh, databases. 
Now, it's also important to design for failure. That's really a big element of the reactive systems, of the reactive manifesto. Um, you can basically do this in several ways. There are quite a bit of libraries that enable um, these things. For example, the Netflix stack is pretty great when it comes to them. Um, also, well, basically it's important that you're, for example, if you use microservices that, that, they, that they die in a graceful way, that your users still get um, quite a bit of functionality. Another way to see this is when you use an offline mode, uh, when you use an application. Well, it's a pretty fun game to play, the one with the dinosaur, but it's usually something you don't want to have your users see. You basically want your users to be able to deliver business value. And for example, you could build an offline mode in your application, and um, because you have your UI and your backend. Uh, okay, picture time. Thank you. Um, because, okay, so you basically design your UI in a reactive way as well, and you want to be able to you know, consist consistently deliver business value to your users. Now, what's also important is to don't, well, don't block, really don't block. Um, let your users block there. This really goes on um, on the bit about not trying to have aggregates in your code. Um, basically, when you co use code like this, you will wait until the whole flux has run through. Um, and that's something you don't want to happen because you really lose all your advantages of using reactive programming. Now, when it comes to testing reactive code, well, we're basically programming in a declarative way. And we're basically decoupled from uh, our threading model. And we're working in an asynchronous way. So it's not very easy um, to test it by default. But for example, in Project Reactor, we have a step verifier that can help with this. Um, example of the code is seen below, where we have our uh, big service returning a flux with ordered data, and we basically describe what we expect it to contain in the future. Um, it can also be your one excuse to block. That's okay if you block in that case. Now, uh, when it comes to debugging, it can be a bit harder as well. Um, the biggest advice would be not to write any bugs, so you don't have to debug. Um, but for those programmers that do make mistakes, like myself, um, there are, for example, um, the hooks on operator um, that you can use in um, Project Reactor that enables you to really get a very interesting stack overflow, um, stack, um, stack dump at least, um, results when you actually make a mistake in your code. Uh, this debug mode should only be enabled when you're actually trying to debug, of course, because it's quite expensive to use. Um, another way is by using composable method references, as can be seen here, where we basically try to describe our reactive flow in a declarative way, but we decouple all of our business logic. And by doing so, we basically give our business logic its own place, and we don't have to debug through this um, rather, yeah, um, untestable or undebuggable, at least, uh, reactive code. Now, be sure to remember the following things. Um, beware cargo cults. Really try to decide for yourself, OK, this is a cool technology, or we've used this, this kind of technology in the past, but is it suitable for our organization, for the, things, for the issues we're trying to solve? Uh, be sure to design for failure. Uh, don't block when you use reactive programming. Uh, your reactive code can still be tested and debugged. It can be, it's, it's done in a different way than you're used to, probably, but it can still be done, of course. And when you use uh, reactive data flows, be sure to use composable method references. So thank you for your time.